Welcome, everyone, to the Our Two Cents podcast. My name is Admi here today with Osama. Hello, sir. Welcome to the show. How are you? How's everything? How are the kids? How's the job and the wife? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh <laughs> kids are doing good man i just sent them off to college the other day it's uh it was a sad one you know, but uh i just i Fabulous. made sure to tell them on your way out let everybody know about the mm. hour two cents podcast and where they can subscribe yes where can they subscribe oh kids of osama um i told them make sure to let everybody know that you can go to youtube.com slash at our two cents um or just search us up in the youtube search bar Click subscribe while you're there. Like the video if you enjoyed it. Drop a comment. And then we're also, mm -hmm. I, I also made sure to let them know before they, before they dillied on out of the door that we're yes. also on TikTok at Our Two Cents mm -hmm. Podcast in case some of their friends were less YouTube inclined, you know? There you are. There you are. We're also on the Spotify mm. and the Apple Podcasts. Uh, Audio Our Two only? Cents, of course, you can find us there. Audio only if, if these muggy faces are just too much for you. <laughs> which is understandable. You can find us in the audio format as well. Hey, so we're here today uh, talking about some stuff. Mm. Night Country episode two, part two, actually. Uh, do they rename them? Because when I go into the HBO app to watch on Sunday, it just says part two. Do they give it a name after? Uh, no, I don't think they have names. Interesting. Did the first okay, have a so name? I don't think so. Right? No, it was just no. part one. Uh, but I didn't check back to see if they updated because sometimes they do that to like hide any, yeah, any yeah. giveaways or whatever. No, I, uh, I, but anyway, I saw, I saw like a couple of uh, behind the scenes things with the cast members nice. and they always refer to it as Night Country. And none of the episodes, like usually they name the episode that they worked on, but I didn't get any. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So we're going to talk about episode two, part two there of Night Country. Uh have a little conversation about what else we've been watching mm. not necessarily in theaters but in our cozy homes considering temperature has roughly been about 20 degrees here in new york uh then we're going to talk about today's academy award nominations some of the surprises some of the folks that missed out big misses actually in a couple of categories there we're going to talk about them see how we feel and then just lightly lightly just ever so lightly uh, Ever so lightly, touch on the funeral of Better Call Saul at last week's Emmys. Um, just a little thing there. I'm ready to jump in. Me too, man. I'm 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 more than ready. Okay. Some could say I was even fabulous. Born ready for this one. Fabulous. Okay. So, uh, True Detective. We liked episode one. The vibes were on point. What did we give it? I gave it a 8.5. You gave it 8.5. You gave it a yeah, 7. Yeah, I think it went 7.5. Yeah, 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 yeah. That sounds about right. So we were there. Yeah, we were there. Um, episode 2, what did you make of it? How are you feeling overall before I guess we maybe dive into some specifics? Okay, overall, I felt like a lot of episode 2 was filler, but not in the worst way. I got some okay. additional development on a lot of the characters here, which you would expect of an episode two. One of the biggest, I think, uh, detracting comments a lot of people had for episode one was that there was a lot going on. We kept jumping back and forth between so many people, so many things happening. We got to go a little bit deeper um, on everybody in this episode. We also started with um, the answer to the mystery we got thrown into at the end of episode one, which was... You know, what the hell did they just find in the snow and uh, how did it get found right in the uh, in the beginning of the episode? I remembered our conversation around the the the, the, the cosmic fantasy elements to this show uh, before this episode. Yeah. And I think they gave an answer to it uh, when we had the woman. I'm forgetting her. I'm forgetting her name. The elderly woman talking about her husband who passed away a while ago um, yes. from cancer. Rose, I think Rose might be right. Um, her. Uh, yeah. Husband passing away a long time ago and how she continues to see him and a lot of people we get the, we got the theme throughout the episode of a lot of people seeing people and seeing things and i think it's one of those that's like them directly saying hey like this is just one of those things when you live in a small desolate weird town like this fictional town of ennis yeah. um you just see things and it's up to us as an audience to be like well that's because you know it's it's your mind playing tricks on you or it's because of the spiritual element that underpins the entire show Either way, it's cool. We talked about it last week. I like that they just continue to kind of toe the line on mm -hmm, that, especially mm -hmm. because it mirrors the line between uh, white and brown in this case on the show, right? Like we got a lot more um, 
conflict in this episode between the white people living in Ennis, Alaska, and the indigenous native folks living in uh, Ennis, Alaska. You got it. You saw it with the bar scene, um, with the drunk guy kind of blowing up on uh, this native girl, and you saw it with the themes for Navarro visiting that same guy later, and you know, kind of like right. yelling at him about it. Um, we get it continuously between Danvers and Navarro, and you see even in Danvers' family, it's kind of complicated. She has her daughter, who's clearly half uh, native, but then she speaks weirdly to the the grandma that she visits in the other house um, yeah. uh, about like like don't don't paint that on my daughter's face, you know, like what does she call her like a <laughs> laundromat old lady or something like that. That's that's a bit. I gotta that's say a bit something. crazy. Yeah, I, I gotta say something on that yeah. scene. That scene felt terrible. Are you? Is the dog okay, bruv? Oh, you can hear that. What are you doing? Am I am I witnessing? Do you see this, yo, Peter? This brothers in Brooklyn. You see, sometimes when you have a dog, <laughs> you know, dogs tend to whine when they want something. All right, she's a whining gal. Yeah, yes, of course, yes. Uh, so, yeah, no, on that point, I will say uh, the delivery of that line or that line itself, I haven't made up my mind, very ill-placed or like too on the nose or I don't know what, but it just felt like, oh, so we're really trying to make her out to be a bad person here. It felt very inorganic. Like, yes, somebody like her would be oddly, I guess, for whatever her reasons are, racist like that but it just felt so aggressively racist and she's <laughs> not that aggressively racist during the show yeah. like she's it's obviously there uh but she feels some type of way but that one line mm-hmm. i was like oh so they really want to convince us it was the first so moment where really she wasn't subtle it. in any way like you kind of get it yeah i mean then yeah. again uh, you know i say that and then i remember the line from episode one where she goes like did a spirit animal like show that to you to 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 navarro right, right. and it's like oh, that's kind of over the top too of a comment and you got that is you got a sense for like at least that one came from like vitriol for this person um per yes. se not that you know racism yes. should be qualified by any means <laughs> but this one for <laughs> I, I guess she had vitriol for this lady for corrupting her daughter quote unquote um yeah by uh showing her her native roots so we got a little bit of a, a of context as to why she might be so sensitive about it clearly she had a partner whether he was a boyfriend i think his name is jake that they allude to um right whether he was a boyfriend or a husband or whomever um clearly she was intimate with this girl's father and clearly cared for him and so maybe a lot of that, a kid yeah yeah exactly well i don't think the kid is hers I think it's. I oh, you, think, oh no, you don't think so? I think she's his daughter, and a daughter. No, no, no. The daughter, yes, but I, I mean the boy that died. Oh, she, that she's boy. a young boy as well. Yeah, I, I'm assuming. Yeah, the daughter was there. Yeah. Then yeah, they yeah. met together, had a kid, and then I guess the boy passed or whatnot. So I, was it the accident? Or it was a I, car accident, I, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, car accident. But is that boy yeah. really her son? I think so. I think he. I think, I think that's the implication. Hank is his father, and I think his mother was someone else, and that he's now, he now works at the police station under his father. No, 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 not that boy. There's a younger boy she sees in a flashback. Remember, she has memories. Oh, when oh, she the one that the passed. Polar bear. The one that passed. Yes. Got gotcha, yes, gotcha, yes, gotcha, yes, gotcha. yes. I'm like, oh, I'm like, yes. uh, I don't think that's her. That's her son. <laughs> It's like, how do I say There's this? There's too many storylines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, nah, no, nah, but yeah. um, I think. Maybe the, the 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 point there is that this vitriol we're talking about might be misplaced. It's not. It comes up as racism, but it's right. more her right. not wanting to think about her daughter ac- Maybe, ac- yeah. accepting um, this past because the past reminds her of this past yeah. that she's uh, scared of thinking about. I guess that's valid. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot to dive into. Again, no time to dive into either any of them because we're running through it all. But I feel like this episode, the pacing drop significantly from last one so I, that's why it initially felt like a lot of filler but i think that's good because it's filler that we felt i felt was missing from episode one so i'm not too mad at the lack of progress and action this episode especially because as a commenter so generously commented on our last uh, youtube video uh we needed this moment i think to establish a better relationship between denvers and navarro so um 
in episode one, it kind of felt, and this commentator pointed this out, that it felt like two hard-nosed uh, detectives. You, typically, you'd have a different mold. You'd have one super hard-nosed detective, one that's a little bit more lighthearted or open to collaborating together. And it felt like in the first episode, they were both that hard-headed, like, egotistical detectives. And now you kind of right. see this evolution a little bit where Navarro's opening up to working with her more and Denver's is opening up to working with Navarro more as well. So um, it was needed in terms of fleshing out the characters and you got to see a lot of their personal lives as well. Um, and I'm, uh, I'll tee that up for you for, to cover it because there's a lot going on yeah. on Christmas, which barely was noticeable that it was Christmas, but yeah. I just love it. It's uh, another adjacent Christmas uh, film or something. <laughs> I win all the time is the point here. Look, on the point of like things being filler, I, I'm going to have to, I see it not as the greatest thing, to be honest with you. There's a lot of storylines in this. And I mean, just our little back and forth on the something mm -hmm. is kind of the point of this is a six episode season, right? I keep forgetting that. We yeah. have, yeah. We're at thirty three percent of the way there. <laughs> that's done. That's insane. Yeah. Okay. Um, I am worried at how many moving pieces there are here, uh, and, and I'm I'm slightly worried about the time given to them and whether we're going to see them brought to fruition. Uh, one of the examples is the storyline of uh, Dan versus. Uh, daughter, stepdaughter, I don't know what that relationship is, mm -hmm. but her sort of figuring out, I guess, or expressing her sexuality w with her partner, for example, like that, that thing. Um, it was part of the first episode. It's part of episode two. So it's clearly not just we're going to mention it and just let it be, but yeah. we're, we're going to actively pursue it. So the decision to pursue those lines or to pursue uh you know the young cop and his daughter and the relationship there and he's not home a lot and because of danvers like that also being a thing mm -hmm. like there's a lot of these tertiary storylines that we're choosing to really some spend some time with again mm -hmm. not not huge portions of the sh of the episode of the show but it does kind of jam up what we're going towards i feel at times does it flesh out characters? Yes. But when you think, again, I, I just go back to the whole, there's six episodes here. Um, I, it's, it's a little bit of a red flag for me. Mm. I am slightly worried with, with yeah. that. That's totally fair on the number of episodes because I didn't, I keep assuming it's eight <clears throat> and it's not going to be eight, yeah. it's six. And we, yes, you're right. We are a third of the way there. But I do have an appreciation for, even if they never close the loop on a lot of these storylines, the fact that they're touched on gives me more color to the motivations, to the inspirations, to their to the to why they do the things that mm -hmm. they do throughout the episode, to um, why this town is the way it is, and some of the backstory. You can glean a lot from one line mm -hmm. of dialogue. It's it's really honestly a well written show. You can glean a lot from one line of dialogue in terms of that character's history, present, and their future. So that's a sign of really good storytelling there. And so for me. Maybe in a show like this where a lot of these, as you said, are tertiary uh, 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 plot lines, I don't mind if they never get closed or they never get resolved or we never get some kind of understanding as to, you know, how they tie to the major plot line because of the fact that I know this show has to th like this show has to conclude that major plot line. And some of these smaller things might give us a little bit more color as to why we're focusing on these characters in this story specifically. So I, I hear you. It's a little bit early to judge for me, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Timing wise. Yes. The pacing slowing down drastically is concerning knowing mm -hmm. that the, the season is even shorter than we'd expected. Yeah, it is. It is. And it is to the point of like, it's early to tell. Yeah. I'm not ready to make sweeping judgments. I don't think I will be until the last episode, but I just want to point these things because sometimes a season or a show ends and I feel a certain way. Usually if it's like an un unsatisfactory, it's hard to pin down why. Mm -hmm. So I I'm just with this one, not like painting it badly, but I things that are kind of not hitting for me, I want to note as I go along to see if either they get alleviated or they don't matter or, or whatnot. Yeah. The other thing with this episode that was a bigger issue for me personally. And again, it's late to say whether it's going to be a bad thing or not is the callbacks to season one. Um, so there's a whole thing of like the spiral being back. Yeah. 
they are very clear to mention Rust Cole's dad is Travis. Um, and pretty on the nose, name right? Trout. This time, like it was like yeah, like la- last Rose, week it was cool yeah. because it was like um, yeah, yeah, like that could they could be connected, like they probably are. <laughs> now it's like they're connected, guys. Like they are indeed connected. <laughs> Right. So they're doing a lot of that this season, by the way, where it's like, nudge, nudge. Give did you, you get it? Yeah. 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 They, they give you a lot. Um, and it, it kind of brings me back to my point of season of, of episode one, where I was saying they're being very upfront with the mystical elements of the show. Mm-hmm. Like they're very much confirming. Yes, they're a thing. Right. And those three instances of the spiral and Tuttle and Cole, all three of them being very on the nose again. I am not a huge fan because this show is meant to be somewhat of an anthology with yeah. some loose connections. And for me, what actually is sort of the the bigger, you know, bigger issue is that the loose connection worked really well because I always come back to that like line that 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 Rust drops in season one, which everybody loves, and it's not become part of I don't know, our colloquial talk of like time is a flat circle, right? Right. And the whole thing of that is shit repeats. It echoes. It's not the exact same, but things are similar over time. Love that line, right? huh? I yeah. Maybe you, great line. Maybe you should watch a whole show made around that line. It's called <laughs> it's called Dark. It's on Netflix if you want to check it out. I, I can't remember if I recommended this before. Incessant propaganda for this show. <laughs> one day. One day. No, but the thing that worked for me so well with that line is because you could watch season. I, I watched season three. I skipped two, but I watched three and it had that loose connection. And it made sense to me because thematically it fit in with season one, even if, you know, the show wasn't together. That's what works really well with an anthology for them to literally give you spiral, the spiral, Tuttle and Cole. This better be a red herring, bruv. If I see Matthew McConaughey in this show, I'm going to turn off my TV <laughs> the minute this brother walks on screen. I will turn off my TV. I'm really that that's a bigger worry than multiple storylines and and all that stuff. That's a bigger worry for me because yeah. it kind of defeats the mystery. So it better be a red herring. Yeah, I, I would be. hope so. I what doesn't uh, help in that case is I, like some of the behind the scenes. I just was clicking on the extras on each. Oh, on, great. On Max. Great. Some I didn't watch it. Some of the behind them, the so scenes tell me. were like um, Issa Lopez, like talking about, um, you know, like a lot of the, like a lot of the, the creative inspiration for this was to go back to season one and like really um, like tie this to what was working for the show. Um, my hope when I originally saw that was that, they meant like theme wise and um, plot wise, not literally like bringing back season one. And I would hope based on the reviews that we saw that that isn't the case, because I do think like it would have probably gotten slammed a little bit for 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 doing that again. I, I don't know yet. And season two didn't give me much. I mean, episode two, sorry, didn't give me much hope for where this was going, because it did feel like it kind of like it was just so drastically different from episode one, I felt in terms of pace energy right? everything that i was like oh like i found myself like three quarters of the way through i'm like it's almost over like i feel like i didn't get much and in the last episode i was like we're only halfway in i just I've, i'm like this is insane right now this is too much i felt like they could have done a better job kind of splitting those across the two to be honest with you like there's no reason any episode to your point should feel like filler in a six episode season so um th- there's no excuse for where, that where where are you on that if this becomes how how much connection do you want you know like oddly enough i was after watching the second episode i was like i want to go this is making me want to go back and rewatch season one but i'm like is that a good thing like because i feel like now i need homework i need i have homework to do and that should not be happening in an <laughs> anthology series like you said and so right. for me i'm on the it was nice when it was just last episode if this continues every other episode I'm not like that. Like the t- I, we could have done without the total thing. Like I don't, I don't need the the like the backing organization behind Salal to be the same organization from season one. Like, <laughs> I, like it did. Like, yeah. I mean, it, it's nice when there's like distant. Like I like right. those distant references. Like, Echoes. Hey, yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Like this. 
this guy could yeah. be, you know, Cole's father here in Alaska. There was that one throwaway line in, in season one where this might be a callback to that. Nice. Like this is the, these are the, the writers saying, hey, if you clock that good for you, you're a good fan. This is like a nice little fan service moment. If not, then don't sweat it because it's irrelevant to the storyline for, for season four. I hope it stays that way and isn't actually relevant to the storyline. Um, otherwise, it would. It also just ruins the rules of the show. Like uh, that's just pointless. But anything's up for grabs I, because the past two seasons were like poor in comparison. So you don't know like what the the objective of the season was coming into it. I think I think even if it's done well, like a part of me is going to be disappointed because I. With the new location, you know, this sort of new vibe to it, mm -hmm. obviously you have the, the mystery and all that stuff. But, like, going so far away from that first season visually um, and then to link it back via plot mm -hmm. seems so safe. Like, you know, like, I went – if they if season four had been – we're back in like Louisiana and all this and all that. I would have been very lukewarm starting it. Right. I've been like, okay, I'll watch, but like, I'm not super excited. The hard break in location was so important because to me, at least it signaled we're like taking it in new directions, you know, yeah. two female cops this time, like that sort of thing. So to come back and lean on the past here. Even if it did work, that's fine. That doesn't mean it's the only way it works. And I, I I didn't watch the bonus, mm -hmm. but it just feels like, yes, it worked, but it worked because you had two very specific characters and location and situation. So I, I genuinely hope it's a red herring. What kind of bothers me is it's so obviously a red herring, I hope, <laughs> that I'm kind of annoyed because even that's not playful. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean... They have to know that a lot of people are have not seen season one, right? Like this is what a decade. I, later? I, I don't know. There's no I, way. I, I don't know. There's no way they're dropping like crucial elements to the story that refer to season one. That, that's that's what I believe is like the real like the real proof that this is not going to be in, integral to the story. That it is a red herring, like you said, because there's no way they expect anyone to have seen season one from so long ago like, as an expectation obviously it's one of the best seasons of all time but not as an expectation so? you think so this. though as a season four of the show do you think so though yeah i feel like they might be banking on that because it's season four of this show yeah but it's so long season four when they're one year apart fine season four right. a decade away mm -hmm. is ridiculous like you you like that's like a re reboot at this point like you can't this is not and it's and you know it's an anthology series, so people are definitely not coming into that. Like people are coming in, going, "Oh, I can get, just start the show now. It doesn't. It's fine. Like it doesn't matter if I just start it right now." I think. I mean, what? <laughs> I was gonna ask, yeah, it's done. What would you think? It's, what would you think if 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 season four nah, was? Don't say this. No, no, no. What would you do about part. a about a, a completely scrap the season? Because what I was gonna say is, what's disappointing is the stuff that's cool about this season isn't the references yes. to season one it's actually like yes everything we've talked about the its own thing the setting the story everything is already cool so actually this is a weird instance where you know you mentioned the phrase they're leaning on season one which is weird because none of the season one stuff that they're putting in here and obviously all our reactions are post them making the entire show so it doesn't matter what we say now it's not going to change anything right yeah but <laughs> all of the quote-unquote leaning on season one is actually detracting from what we're already loving about the show not actually adding to it at all it was nice in episode one that like we were like oh that's cool it, it feels like a little bit of an extra like thought was put into it but now it's like wait was it nah, extra worried, thought bro. put in or bro, <laughs> was, that the, nah. was that the source material for this season i'm worried i'm yeah. worried because the fact that the thing with cole is like from episode one and then two you confirm yeah. he's the dad you're not dropping it there you're not dropping it there because now you've you've done it for too long if it's yeah, one episode wink why, wink why fine. say he's the dad like why <laughs> Because he's coming back. No, because no, he's no, coming no. back. Stop, 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 stop. <laughs> no, no, no. If he does, if he does. I was going to ask you, like, what would you do if, <laughs> in a, before the season started if they decided we're dropping a season, old Maddie Mack and Woody Harrelson nah, pulling I'm up. I'm not for it, bro. Like, I'm not for it. Pull, not, 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 the for same, it. not the same uh, like location or anything. New location, same guys, same stories, like, like same characters, I mean. But 
they're coming back for a reunion <laughs> for True Detective, man. What do you what do you say? I know you're watching that. You're gonna watch that. Like, don't pretend like you're Bro, not watching. I'm watching it. it. I'm watching it, but like, I'm not. I'm not excited, bruv. Like, I, I think too many people are trying to do this thing with the show of, like, yeah. capturing lightning in a bottle again with this. Like, no. IP? I think what's so good... Yeah, <laughs> Everything has to be. What's so good about that first season is because it's free of constraint from literally anything else prior to it. Yeah. I remember watching the first couple episodes and being like, are they on one with this? <laughs> like... This dude's dropping, you know, pessimistic philosophy on the side. Woody's not paying attention. It, there's like a weird, creepy vibe, but they're not like fully leaning into it. I'm like, I don't, I don't. What, what are we doing for the first couple yeah. episodes? And then it fleshes itself out and becomes its own thing, and it owns itself for being what it is, which I think is like it's risky because it could go wrong, but because it it owns it, it and and it sticks to landing, it's why people love it so much. Like, there's a bunch of good mystery shows out there, but how many of them are truly like, oh, this is top notch. I think this is like one of the best ones. So that's what I always loved about it. So for to, to like bring it back in a way is, is it's like digging up a grave, man. Like, just let it yeah. lie, yeah. you know, let it lie. So I'm, I am worried. I'm going to be honest with you. That's like my biggest issue right now. Yeah, I'm t if I see a cameo, brev, oh my god, the MCU will have infiltrated season <laughs> one of True Detective. What are we saying? <laughs> what are we saying, brev? And that'll also like ruin the, you know, the retroactive feelings about season one. Like if they did that too, because now it's like the lasting thought of that season is their cameos in season four, which no one wants. I don't think. And it would it would flatten Navarro's character. It would flatten Danvers' character. Bro, when I mean I would not care, or not me, but like what general viewers would not care for them, it would drop like a rock in water, man. Right. They would go, I don't care about him anymore. Do McConaughey ha Harrelson all, all day now. <laughs> but uh, so I, I genuinely, I hope they don't, I hope they keep it, you know, Believe in yourself. Believe yeah. in the story and the characters you started with and the location and all that. Because we're, th I'm still there. Like I'm not, I'm not quitting on the show. Let me ask but you I'm this: worried. Are on that same note, are Danvers and Navarro intriguing enough protagonists? That's a good question, and I went back and forth on this. I actually wrote it down as a note. I really don't like the Danvers character in terms of how shitty she is, mm -hmm. because it can't. It's just pure shit right now. <laughs> like it's that's there's what, no. Like, that's the, actually why I think the, it's refreshing. But go ahead, go ahead. I don't know, man. I feel like to be to be, uh, and I don't want to say likable because you don't have to be likable to be compelling. What I think is mm -hmm. more relevant is to be compelling. Yeah. You can be shitty, but if you're compelling, I'm all on board for this. Um, there's there's too few things that make her compelling at this point, and I think it's largely down to it being a one note character right now. The gleaming sh shimmers of hope in the character come from past events. Yes which is fine but because that doesn't link her to anyone right now it's kind of like mm -hmm. it's just a shitty person being shitty and i think there's some avenues where you know you could have done i mean the christmas tree thing was kind of cute it didn't work out you know she's doing her own thing right. um but like again i you don't need to copy what was done in the past but i'm just trying to think like woody harrelson is a pretty shitty character from that first season bro Brother's cheating on his wife, doing all sorts of madness, right? Out there in Louisiana. In the bayou. <laughs> in the bayou. <laughs> Why? This <laughs> brother mucking it in the mud, man. Uh, he's got kids at home <laughs> and he's been doing that oh god <laughs> <laughs> but here, here's why <laughs> Yo, something, something about the visual of <laughs> Woody Harrelson in the bayou <laughs> oh my god <laughs> 
Okay, well, that's a clip. I'm, I'm crying, man. Um, oh, I'm crying, bro. Oh, nah, here's, <laughs> here's, here's why I think Danvers is... Yeah, do you like him? Yeah, I okay. I think Danvers is compelling for me personally. And I, and I, hear, and okay. I hear you on this because the people I've watched it with okay. have both said they they agree with you like they don't find denver's compelling and it was slightly surprising yeah. to me because what i find compelling about her character is one you mentioned it the fact that there's this mysterious past that we're just not aware of right two i think is that you can tell she's she's one of those like secretly really good detectives that's just a piece of yes. shit, right like yes uh it, it it we got glimpses of it in this episode with her boss um kind of telling her like he she got this promotion basically but like why is she trying here like she's one of those that's like she's probably yeah, naturally she gifted and you could see mm -hmm. it with which is my favorite scene of the entire show so far the scene where she and what's his name uh I'm forgetting the the young the young detective Pryor. Pryor. Yeah, his last name is Pryor, but whatever his first name is, Richard uh, Richard Pry Dick Pryor. In <laughs> Imagine it's just Richard Pryor, man. On serious podcast right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I promise we're not high. I promise. <laughs> no but to be honest like uh when i saw that last name i had the same thought i was like <laughs> the priors that's, that's who they are yeah yeah but um <sighs> the scene in the in the in the in the rink right when where, they do the questions where they do the question yeah. back and forth my favorite mm -hmm. scene so far and that's where you see like she's got a system like she's and i, I really like the system of questioning right it's very philosophical right it's like you're not you're not it's not about what the answer to this question is. It's about, are you asking the right question in the first place? And you see that multiple times, right? Either in that scene or with Navarro, when she kind of channels her Danvers, which I thought was like slightly yeah, like, okay. okay, like, yeah, is this, is she, is she a superhero? Like this, not like you guys don't have that kind of a relationship as far as we know for you to be right. like right. evoking her in a random scene where you're like, where you're with this guy who sweet guy, by the way, that's how you know he's going to die. Like at some point, Kavik. Yeah. Kavik um yeah. yeah really nice guy those pancakes look busting not gonna lie i really needed that <laughs> but um the 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 scene in the gym was really cool because it's it, it gives you this glimpse into how she is compelling yeah. like she's going to unravel this we got a tiny tiny little taste of it with at the end of episode one where she sits amidst a spiral of photos that she drops down and trying to piece this thing together that's where i think the compelling nature to her character comes from for and that's why I'm like, I don't, I think it's really refreshing that she's through and through a piece of shit. And it's clear that that's as a result of whatever's happened in her life. And she's, I think what's compelling to me is she's very unapologetic about it. Like she's, mm -hmm. she's going to this, to, to her boss's door and he's like, well, so you fucked me at work. So now you want to fuck me in the, uh, at my house? She's like, yeah. So you want to like, that is like. We're not dancing around here like that's an unapologetic character right and and she has clear power and she's got that aura as they might say in in, in football compilations she's just got the aura about her right so that's why i think she's yeah. compelling navarro i'm a little bit on the fence about because i think the the most compelling aspect to her character is that she's she's truly caring and she has this like yes. innate desire to defend the women of ennis alaska right because clearly they're kind of taking advantage of in multiple areas and specifically the native women in Ennis, Alaska, who you right. have to assume she's a part of and at least half a part of. And that is like, that to me is like the very easy way to make a compelling character in this story. I think the non easy way that she's also compelling is the fact that she's just also of this powerful force, both physically and like psychologically in this show where she's able to show complete, um you know psychological vulnerability with her sister or with uh, her roommate right. or, or with kavik for example but then uh is able to like dominate in in other areas as well and still match up one-to-one -one with danvers yes dominate both physically <laughs> and verbally <laughs> <laughs> but yeah like it's like mm. it, she's she we, we laughed in episode one about that kind of domination right like just doing all that and then topping it off with stealing the toothbrush but now in episode two she's genuinely she like she it rounds yeah. it out with a little bit of vulnerability but i still think she's a bit one note in comparison yeah. to danvers where i'm like if she's now too soft 
I'm like, okay, like that that kind right. of defeated all the 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 compelling nature of her character in episode one. But if she's like too hard, then you got these two people who cannot co like collaborate on anything whatsoever. So where does this go? So I, I I'm on the fence a little bit about her character, but I think there is opportunity there for them both to be intriguing. I I'm not so far down on Dan versus a lot of people are. I think Navarro is the one that's a little bit more played safe for sure. Um, she's always played as a bit of a, a protector. She mm-hmm. plays that role constantly, I feel like, in the show. And I think that um, it sometimes limits, I think, the actress's ability to kind of show the range. Yeah. Right? Because you do want to see the multifaceted, you know, aspects of a character. That's what sort of flushes them out and makes them real. I'm kind of in a similar place with Danvers because that, like, hard-nosed detective with, like, a mysterious past is really good at her job. I kind of have seen it before. I appreciate those elements though of actually like seeing the detective work because mm-hmm. I think that that stuff you can you can personalize to Danvers and like this is how she approaches her things, right? Right. Um, so I, I I would like to see them in different aspects. I think we're gonna maybe get it in flashbacks because they keep hinting to several the key flashbacks in both of their lives, be they in Navarro's like military history, be they in Danvers's sort of past relationship and i don't mean just like quick snippet Mm -hmm. flashbacks i think we're going to see things that are a little bit more substantial as the season progresses um to give them that sort of uh full 360 you know character feel because i'm worried with the six episode arcs and two of the six already completed will we get enough to make us feel like we've seen the different faces of each person by the right. end in the present timeline. And this is a show, by the way, that has done this many times in terms of using the past and the future and stuff like that to, to give characters a feeling of realness. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not like only this season would be doing it. So I suspect we'll be heading in that direction, though. Anything else? You... Anything else? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I, 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 tell you when. No, no, you anything else? <laughs> no, I'm. Oh, did we want to score it? Weirdly enough, yeah, I think I mean, we should. Since we did the last one. I'm gonna give this one a six point okay. five. It was enough that like I'm still interested, yeah. but not enough that it felt like a standalone compared to last episode. Yeah, I'm at a I'm at a six ish. Yeah, I'm at a six as well. I go six with it as well. I mean, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a decline, um, and that's okay. Like I feel like some episodes you do need to maybe take a step back before moving too forward. So hopefully we'll see. The mid-season episode next, <laughs> next week. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. We'll see how that goes. So that was uh, True Detective uh, Night Country Part 2 there. Uh, what else have you been watching, Osama? So um, I mentioned this last week. I was watching The Fall of the House of Usher and I explained why it's been very right. uh, hard to complete it. I watched one more episode. <laughs> uh, you're really pulling teeth out. It here. really is pulling teeth. I'm trying to finish this. The episode was slightly better, but again, it's the same problem, so I won't dive too much into that. And then one other thing, I one other one I watched uh, was it two nights ago now um, mm. was uh, Meet the Fockers. I had never seen it. <laughs> I saw, oh, I saw Meet the Parents. What a throwback. Um, obviously, yeah. multiple times, and it was Keanu's first time watching both. And we uh, watched Meet the Fockers. Generally, got really poor reviews online, but I think they're. Uh, unwarranted to be honest with you it's like it's it's kind of like the same as the first movie a little bit bigger scale still funny like uh, um wow i was about to say adam sandler ben stiller and robert de niro are just hilarious in this and then you got like dustin hoffman and um barbara streisand mm-hmm. like really like just really good cast and i thought it was a good sequel so i don't understand all the hate behind it online but it got me thinking about dudes that are just nice and nice. make a movie fun and funny regardless of the quality of the film those are where i now worry because i hadn't watched this movie because of the reviews and how poor they were but now i go there are certain guys and maybe this is a tf for a conversation in the future but there are certain guys Mm. where i feel in my in my mind if they're in it it's not a bad movie it could be a bad technical movie but it's gonna be a fun time and i'm going to enjoy it yeah so it's a it's a Mm -hmm. nice reminder for me to ignore some of the reviews sometimes when i know the cast is really good there's like it's very hard to make that a bad film especially in the comedy genre right like if it's a serious drama 
for sure i'm gonna listen to the reviews a little bit more but when it comes to comedy man like the ceiling is only so high so i'm willing to take it if it's guys like that do you think it's because we now in general don't watch those films anymore like i'll be honest with you like that sort of movie i used to come across a lot more yeah back in the day with like cable yeah. and tbs and all this stuff man, the goat yeah so do you do you feel like the lack of exposure to not bad movies, but, you know, movies that don't take themselves so seriously, that maybe focus more so on the entertainment mm-hmm. and funny moments and, so, and and things like that? Like, do you think the lack of exposure to that makes that movie, I don't want to say seem better, like, you know, you're not watching it straight, but, like, the lack of those sorts of films. Yeah. Weirdly enough, them, statistically, yeah. I feel as we've been exposed to a lot more content with everything being digital and with us being yeah. able to like go on Twitter or Reddit or whatever and see instant reviews and what people are thinking about movies, that's naturally, instead of turning all content uh, viewing viewing or viewership into like a bell curve, it's become this polar experience where you're either like you you're watching a movie because it's really really like really well reviewed or you're watching it because it's really 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 popular like it's a blockbuster it's a mega film things like that mm. movies that are in between that are not well reviewed and not blockbusters right. are immediately in the really shitty category when we've forgotten about the fact that there's a tv film category of like this is like a a good tv film and the, the closest i think example that comes to mind for me is uh like a netflix film like just go straight to netflix for example uh i typically skip past those like the one that showed up for me the other day was kevin hart's one i forgot the name of it um oh the heist one yeah that heist one, one he that had one. and the yeah. review is like the reviews are like so poor for that film right but i go in my head he's a hilarious guy as much as i've kind of like over time stopped enjoying his comedy as much because it got a little bit corny i I know anything he's in will still be funny and fun to watch. There's just so, those guys that are really charismatic. Yeah. Obviously, he teamed up with The Rock for that reason. Like those two guys are like really good at making whatever they're in fun to watch. And then I think in my head, why am I so stuck on the opinion of others when I know it's going to be a fun time? I know this movie is mm-hmm. going to be entertaining, but I still can't bring myself to click on it on Netflix. I'd rather scroll for another three hours trying to decide what I want to watch, settling on some random uh, reality TV cooking show. So it's 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 really <laughs> it's actually gotten gotten to me, like to the point where I'm really pissed off having to search for stuff, which is why I have lists of like a backlog of things. And I go, OK, what's the next thing on that list? And I'll go that way. Do you use it? I do use the list. Like on my okay. phone, I'm saying like I have lists of movies and shows yeah. and then like really what, what creates variability now is like going through the bottom, like the most recent five things on my list and saying like to going to Kiana and saying, what are we going to watch today? And then that's wholly dependent yeah. on the mood, which is that that yes, takes yeah. it like a whole different direction. But that has helped me in the sense of I'm in this stage now where I'm doing that all day long, whether it's YouTube, Netflix, all these other like platforms where I'm like, I need the perfect piece of content for me to even exist right now i can't even take a bite of my food until i know i have the exact content i want to see right now and nothing nothing here is satisfying me at all like i need this immediate instant gratification for what i want and it's it's hard because that means in those moments i need it always feels like time is fleeting and i know everybody experiences this right like it feels like time is fleeting i don't have time i don't have time so whatever i do consume needs to be like the best possible experience for me to consume right now because i have a million things vying for my time and if i choose this kevin hart movie i don't want it's like all of our lives are dictated by the fear of um like opportunity costs right like this fear of like coming out at the end of it two hours later going I really wish I spent those two hours watching some other thing or doing some other thing. And that fear has just made me realize that all of our time has become this like quantified uh, milking of, of, of uh, like gratification and value to the point where yeah. everything is so high value. Everything is so gratifying in life that if anything is even subpar remotely, it's not, the, it's not that we'll die if we will consume it. It's the fact that we will know that this has is a massive opportunity lost for us to have seen something else and progress something else. Things are just moving way too fast. We need to slow down our lives and pick stuff that suck and, and be bored. Uh, one, a person at work actually that I spoke with gave a really good presentation on like the value of boredom and like mm-hmm, like and mm-hmm. that and that's something I channeled. Uh, we were talking about this earlier during my uh, 
you know, last couple of weeks of December heading into this new year of like, I wanted to just be alone, do absolutely nothing but watch stuff, eat stuff, go on walks and remind myself what it feels like to be bored again. And every time that I felt like super bored and I, I had to tell myself, do something, like create something, make something, I had to force myself, no, be bored, enjoy it, reset your like your 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 um your brain because it's 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 craving stimulus no matter like no matter what and so um i'm at this stage now where i'm like i need to watch a lot more um just feel good or silly movies or just like comedies that are not going to be highly rated or even like shitty drama films whatever it is like i i i've spent all of my life watching stuff that's so well rated or like stuff that i know specifically will speak to me that there's a lot of movies mm -hmm. that you you and chris often ask me about that i have not seen purely because yep. i'm so selective about what i watch all of my life and so i need to just that's a, a, a thing for me to work on this year is lowering the standard a little bit on what i do consume so that i can consume more mm -hmm. and i grow from it regardless of we talked about this a million times like you're gonna you're gonna come out of this with something no matter what regardless of whether the movie was an excellently made technical film or it's just a, a waste of time it feels like you'll come out of it with something no i agree i think it, it reminds me so much of like back in the day i used to watch films before i knew about metacritic and rotten tomatoes right. and the friend recommendations and such i used to read a premise like two lines <laughs> where I, oh that shit looks cool and then i'd watch for two hours you know and granted i think that that risk approach I mean, it's so stupid to say that risk approach of like, you know, watch whatever for however long it happened because I, I had more time. Right. So time didn't feel as valuable to me. More time but and I less think, choice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Less choice, mm -hmm. by the way. Yeah. Um, but now it feels like, you know, by the time I finish work and, and, and dinner's made and, you know, laundry and all that shit's done, it's like 8 p.m., and I have time for like <laughs> one, one thing to like really watch the movie right? of the and night. You know what, yeah, and you know what sucks? You know what yeah. actually sucks from this is that I end up not doing that nine times out of ten. I have I've had, <laughs> yeah. and this is like here. Here's my here's my uh, terrible terrible confession, which um, will probably most people will feel they'll disrespect me, but I have heat on 4K. And I bought it. Oh my god! Months Go. ago. Okay. Yeah. Go. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Months ago. Okay. It's a three-hour movie. Yeah. Every night I sit on this couch and <laughs> it's nine p.m. and I go, okay, tonight's the night. It's three hours. You got time. Twelve o'clock. You got time, right? And then whatever happens, time ticks by. Now it's ten o'clock. I can't start the movie anymore. Because in my head, I'm like, now it's too late. I'm going to feel <laughs> sleepy. I'm going to feel this. I'm going to feel that. Yeah. To your point of like, not only does the film or, 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 or video or content need to be optimal, mm -hmm. I need to be optimal. Mm -hmm. We need to meet at the <laughs> yeah. peak of optimal from both sides for me to like take it in the right way. Yeah. It's exactly I, that. I, I can't watch shit casually. Like it's a it's a disease now I have. Mm -hmm. Like it's so hard for me to like put on a movie. Other people have it the other way around. I feel where it's like too casual. Yeah, yeah they yeah. put on the movie and it's just go to the phone. But I'm not talking about like watch a movie and do some other shit. I just mean watch a movie and feel okay stopping halfway because I got to go to bed. I can't I can't do this. Okay, I can't do this yeah. for whatever reason, and it sucks. And you know what ends up happening actually. The reason I think I've like moved to YouTube now for my late night content is because that feels less serious because I can stop a YouTube exactly. video whenever I feel like it and it doesn't feel like I'm stopping some masterpiece <laughs> halfway. Well, it's funny you say that because I'm very completionist about like about like literally video stuff. Like I can never see uh, a scrubber incomplete. So. <laughs> Actually, with movies and YouTube videos, I'm exactly the same way to the point where right. even on YouTube now, it's I gotten bad, so then. bad. When I scroll on YouTube, it's I'm adding everything to the watch later. Ask me if any of those get watched later. Not not <laughs> a single time. So I'm spending the whole time just scrolling and adding stuff to watch later. And I'll watch maybe yeah. one video. And then I'll like halfway through, I'm like, uh, like this wasn't the right one. You know, like I was supposed <laughs> to magically know it was the right one. But now I still got to finish it because I'll be pissed off yeah. if I don't finish this video. I got like an, un an incomplete yeah. video where we are. We are dying. <laughs> we are slowly dying. You know, what's crazy. What's crazy is like we literally bitch and moan about studios 
doing this exact thing. <laughs> this is why they do IPs. Yeah. This is why it's sequels and prequels. I, I'm 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 so serious. Yeah. There's we are our risk is time, which it's still valuable, mm -hmm. but it's not two hundred million. Right, right? right. But it just it just feels like it's the same issue ballooned up to you know whatever the sizes of of the film industry yeah and it's weirdly i think it's also just an echo of just human experience behavior the need to want to get the most out of everything and you know coming to grips with that not always being the case i mean hopefully we get to it like we us two personally get to it one day mm -hmm. because that i think frees you up to do stuff like just stuff without it needing to end that's, that's the other thing yeah we we always want the the like the ends to justify the journey type of thing yeah. when it's really just about the watching of it. That's it. Like you don't, I don't need to get to the end of the movie and have like a life thing to <laughs> yeah. take from it, man. Yeah. Like just, just the movie watching of it yeah. is enough. Just that experience. That's how I felt watching enough. meet the fuckers. I was like this, I don't care about like, I'm not gonna care about this in the future, <laughs> but that was so fun. Like me and my partner just sat there yeah. watching it. Such a great time, and I feel good. I feel great, and I didn't think yeah. I would before watching it. I was like, I want to watch it just because I watched Meet the Parents. Meet, yeah, yeah, Meet yeah. the Parents recently yeah. is it's worth watching that. But yeah, you're you're a hundred percent spot on. It's like for studios, they're gonna go. Well, people are already thinking this, so let's give them what they're familiar with, what they already told us they like. So here's here's Guardians of the Galaxy seventy five because you already like the the first whatever uh, couple. So yeah, it's 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 spot on, and 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 it's funny because Heat and Casino are two of those for me that have just been sitting, sitting in the backlog both. for so long yeah. uh, and oh, i know okay, robert man. de niro is one of my favorite actors of all time <laughs> i know it's gonna be good and they're well-rated movies what is going on but yeah <laughs> to your point and that's why the two it's weeks terrible. i said before new year's was pivotal because yeah. i didn't feel like time was fleeting i actually felt like time was going slowly because making yourself bored is like really slowing down time and then going well i have so much time and what am I doing with this? And I go, okay, well, just watch mindless shit. And I don't feel like I, and I, while I'm watching it, I don't feel like time is fleeting because guess what? There's another two weeks of this. So just continue whatever you want to do. Yeah. And it's, 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 we have to like force to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit of that, that, that safety net of having it to, to, it's okay to waste. We gotta you know, quit our jobs, man. Waste, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. Subscribe, please, so we can uh, <laughs> make our dreams just... come true of being bored, guys. Please. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Speaking of um, three-hour movies, uh, so I watched Kingdom of Heaven mm. this week, uh, which, by that title alone, <laughs> probably tells you it should have been a TV show because of just how big it is. So. <laughs> Just real quick, I'll just read the uh, the little IMDb uh, yeah. or the Google the thing. So anyway, uh, still in grief over his wife's sudden death, village blacksmith Balin, played by Orlando Bloom. This is when Orlando Bloom was hot shit. Mm. 2005, baby. Take me back. Joins his long estranged father, Baron Godfrey, played by Liam Neeson, as a crusader on the road to Jerusalem. After a perilous journey to the holy city, the valiant young man enters the retinue oh i don't know what that word is of the leprous king baldwin the 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 fourth played by edward norton mm. which is rife with dissent led by the treacherous guy de l'union i think he's french whatever who wishes to wage war against the muslims for his own political and personal gain directed by this is one of them ones um sir ridley scott mm. okay had a tumultuous time at the box office he's a sir he's a Only knight I don't know. I kind of just said it. But... <laughs> hey, the, the fact that it's not out of the realm of questioning is... is... It, it felt phonetically correct. <laughs> like it just sound or not, not uh, you know, sounded correct. Um, it, 218 million at the box office cost, I think, well north of 100 million, actually. Let me see. Mm. Um, let me just confirm that real quick. Uh, yeah, 130 million, which in 2005... Is still a huge deal. I mean, he's coming off of Gladiator as well, just to put Ridley Scott in the timeline. Banger. Um, yeah. So the film releases in a two hour, 20 minute format, by the way, gets slammed up by critics and fans. People hate it. Hate it. Not a good time, right? S within the year, I believe, uh, I forgot the, the the studio, releases a director's cut, which is about three hours long, mm. which is now the, like the definitive version of the film, which is the one I watched. Uh, so we're not talking about that, although that's also an interesting point. Ridley Scott 
has this weird issue of just consistently uh, somehow not getting his final vision of a film in theaters. Napoleon as well was released in a theatrical version, and then there's a longer version on Apple TV. Um, The question, though, I have here that I came out of that movie with, first of all, I really liked it. Huge, huge, uh, you know, epic film. It reminded me of when I was watching Game of Thrones, Mm -hmm. a lot of politics, lots of interesting characters. Obviously, this one is baked in real happenings. So the Third Crusade, Mm -hmm. I believe it's the Third Crusade this one takes place in, happened. Characters are mostly real. The actual story, very fiction, right? Very, very fiction filled. Um, And I actually went back, I was just reading a little bit about the... uh, the sort of feedback this movie got and it very much echoed the exact feedback Napoleon got. And and the feedback was, you know, it's a great film, huge, you know, sets and in terms of the praise that it did get, um, you know, huge sets and some, some solid performances. The thing that they always hit the film with was about its lack of historical accuracy. Mm. And there were some historians actually who came out saying that so many people in modern day, you know, have such a, a lack of understanding of what the crusades were. And so when you have a huge picture like this, that comes out, it becomes the definitive image somebody has right. of a time like that. Right. And, you know, he obviously makes stylistic choices, character choices, things like that to portray uh, groups a certain way, people a certain way and things like that. Um, my question is, uh, because this is exact issue he had with Napoleon, and this is actually why I didn't go watch it. It wasn't necessarily because of the iffy uh, reviews were, were okay to good, um, but it was because it wasn't historically accurate, and I didn't go watch it in theaters because of this, which got me thinking: Should these movies, when they do this, be historically accurate? Do they have a responsibility to be historically mm-hmm. accurate, and and to what degree? And I'll, I'll throw that to you first. Yeah, great question. Um... So I have, as you can probably imagine for yourself as well, I have a lot of loaded thoughts on right. uh, on this topic. I think. Okay, let's let's start with the distinction between there's films, movies, and then there are documentaries, right? So right. obviously they for sure should be held to different standards, right? Documentary, even though they almost always aren't should be a hundred percent accurate, right? Like they, that is like what you're billing to the audience. You are portraying a real story in real time on the screen, essentially. And it should be a very real depiction of what truly happened. Again, you can talk about bias. You can talk about other stuff. That's okay. Like that is like bias storytelling is just what history books do as well. So I don't mind that, but it's an attempt at, real like really telling the story that went down, right? yep. Yep. the yep. in the film world i then bring that d- distinction into another two right so there is historical fiction built as historical fiction as in a story of a completely fictional story set within a realistic moment in history which is one of my favorite genres personally for both movies and book and then there's not historical fiction, but a historical film. So a film about something that has happened in history. So this, the distinction here is like historical fiction could be something like, um, uh, national treasure, right? These dudes, they're using like, or like if you ever read Da Vinci code or anything like that, like you're using, um, real life elements, but twisting Mm -hmm. it, for your fictional story that everyone is aware is very completely fictional, right? Like national treasure. You can't just go steal the declaration of independence and then go do your own thing. And it's pretty obvious. I mean, (laughs) fictional film or like, or like, for example, Pocahontas, that to me is like historical fiction or sorry, no, sorry. You know what? That's a real character. So that's a completely bad example. (laughs) That's a completely bad example. But I would say, if you were to set like a love story during the Crusades in Kingdom in Kingdom of, of Heaven, right? So I say Kingdom yeah. Hearts. That's crazy. Whatever. Um, Kingdom of Heaven, Chain of Memories, baby. <laughs> Ridley Scott back for the sequel. <laughs> if you had a love story during the Crusades that never really happened, like, all right, this is historical fiction. It's a uh, fictional story that's set in a non-fictional really? time period, right? And right. I have okay, and 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 uh, and then uh, historical film would be a film about the crusades 
that also has these subplot lines in it that are less relevant with the, the actual purpose of the film is about the okay. Crusades itself. So examples of that, as you mentioned, would be Napoleon, would be like uh, Oppenheimer last year, movies like that, right. that are very specifically about either a real character or a real moment in time or an event mm -hmm. or an object or something like that. So again, so the, 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 three, the three distinctions for me are documentary and then film within film, historical fiction, and just historical film. To me, those two within film personally have different... I have different standards for as well. Okay. For historical fiction, it's not the 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 objective of the film is not about a real thing. It's just using the real thing as an environment or a coloring mm -hmm. aspect of the film. So like we're in this time period, like Game of Thrones, historical fiction. It's like we're in well, they don't never actually dictate what the time period is, but you can assume this is like some medieval times. And these are really completely fictional characters. They're legit dragons. Fantasy. Yeah. It's fantasy, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, right yeah. But something like, you know, Oppenheimer, and in this case, it sounds like Kingdom of Heaven, stuff like that. It's like, it is crucial to the story that this is this time period. This is this um, non-fictional element to it, whatever. It's the, it's the event of the Third Crusades or... Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, if in Oppenheimer's case, it's a literal human being in time who existed, all biopics fall into that category, for example. Right. So I think the, my biggest issue is when the Delta between real and not like, like, like between accurate and non and inaccurate depiction falls in the historical film category in the historical fiction category. If you mystify that time period or anything else like that i don't care because the it doesn't affect the main storyline which is with the purpose of i don't know what it, it's a love story or it's like some sure. war shit going on or whatever else it is you're just you're 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 taking something that people already know and kind of carving it around a story that people don't know and that's okay with me when you're taking a story that people do know or sh or could know or could be aware of let's take oppenheimer for example I have a bit of a higher standard for the accuracy that has happened in the film. And the reason I have that is because we, it's easy to say it's the job of a documentary to, you know, be accurate for, you know, like historical reasons. And for a film, the, the main purpose is entertainment. And I completely yep. hear that point. However, we as humans, we talked about this before, we are creatures of storytelling right like the way we've actually passed down history for all time has been through story right whether it's through oral mm -hmm. story um whether it's through written story or whether as we're talking about right now it's through depiction and film and so very often when you have a film industry that has quite a more significant impact than books and literature in today's day or like even mm -hmm. uh social media or anything like that that there's now an onus on that medium to not completely destroy that oral dictation of history that we're continuing to pass down. So the reason I say not completely destroy is because I don't think it needs to continue to shed more light on something or like it has to really flesh out a, a non-fictional uh, element even more, but it needs to not be damaging to the story to the point where because you're a massive film, now a whole generation of people have this understanding of, for example, Napoleon, Oppenheimer, etc., versus how they might have had it if they just read books about this person. It is. Let me just clarify that by saying the standard that I'm talking about is not anywhere near the standard of a documentary. Like this, we mm -hmm. don't need to be completely accurate. If I had to put a, a random number on it, it would be I need this to be 70% accurate. I need it to be like all of the major things need to be true if you play around with the some, some of the subtleties i don't mind if it needs if it if it's helpful for pushing the story along i don't mind and there are examples of many films who've who've kind of like twisted history a little bit to benefit the story but there's a few who completely destroyed it like i never watched lincoln right but that one comes up a lot for people as a film that literally had multiple states voting for slavery that in real life never voted for they voted against slavery for example that to me is a massive you can't twist that element of the story but if this film is about abraham lincoln and about this emancipation and about slavery as a topic you can't tell me more states voted for slavery than actually happened in real life like that is 
damaging because film has an impact regardless of whether it's meant to be taken as literal or not. And so for me, the standard is 70%. It's hard to quantify. And again, it's hard to even dictate. Can I ask you though? Yeah, just, no, I was just going to say, it's hard to even dictate what's yeah. historical fiction versus a historical film. But go ahead. Go ahead. I'm not, uh, this is not disagreeing or anything, but mm -hmm. do you feel like the responsibility or the threshold is higher for film than for a book uh, equivalent of like a historical, um, we called it fiction, right? So yeah. historical fiction, film in book form um, or, or a painting or a, a series of, you know, podcasts that fictionalizes historical happenings. Like, mm -hmm. do you feel the threshold is higher for film because of the impact? And is that fair to a creator or creative? No, I think when you walk into a theater, the expectation is automatically fiction. For example, I think yes. when you tell a story about something that's real, the expectation is that you may dramatize, but you may not, you know, like you may not fictitiously tell the story. Like I think people can distinguish between a dramatization versus a complete rewriting of what truly happened. And to answer your question, I think books and podcasts, et cetera, that are built about this specific topic, like specifically in, in the nonfiction space, I think have a higher standard to be uh, objective than a no, film no, does not yeah. not nonfiction. just it's it's fiction like you go in knowing it's fiction well that's where i go do you think they can get away mm -hmm. with more playing around with it i think they like can the because, da vinci code yeah. for example is highly historical fiction because it right. takes uh jesus the character and does things with the character that yeah for, are quite for blasphemous us, yeah. Are, yeah are quite yeah are quite out there and it, it, it got proper blowback yeah from like I, I met for, for first of all from like Christian groups, but I imagine also from some folks who are historical, did, you know, yeah. history people. So, like, do you think the threshold? That, like, I don't remember the book mm -hmm. getting shit when it came out, yeah. and maybe it's because of my age, but I remember the movie getting shit. Yeah. Well, the movie got shit. <laughs> okay. Here's this is what I was gonna say as my like third uh, argument is. Yeah. A lot of this is also dependent on is the movie good or not. <laughs> like if okay, like, okay, 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 yeah. good, good, good. Because we're before here we now, get there, we're here yeah, yeah. Now. Before yes. before we get there, <laughs> I, uh, this is gonna be like the last card of like okay, like <laughs> if we cannot answer any of the other questions, are you ass? <laughs> like if you're bad, right. then then we're not even going. But before we even get there, I was just gonna say I think yeah, this is also a classification issue. Like for me, I think I had that classification in my head, but we don't do that for films, right? Like you don't go to the theater and parse through like right. which section of the library am I picking this movie from with a book, right. for example, we've developed a very rigid classification system where I'm picking a book sure, out of sure. this fiction section. It's built me as fiction, et cetera. All of movies are technically within the fiction section. Like if you're not a documentary, everything is in the fiction yes. section, yes. but we as society haven't developed that kind of a classification for film to the point where, because a lot of film similar to a lot of books, do like depict something or try to depict something near a hundred percent accuracy. And then a lot of others go, our primary objective here is the drama or the humor or the whatever else. So we're going to be very lenient with how accurate this film is historically. So yeah. do you think if knowing upfront the classification of it, do you think then therefore, not that you're not allowing one or the other, but do you, do you therefore get rid of that threshold then? Like if I go into a film knowing pure, well, it's historical fiction, does that make it better for you, I guess, than me going into that film? Obviously, I know it's fiction, but mm -hmm. then they start talking about historical figures, and now I'm in the theater going, did this happen? Did this not happen? That's a the, good point. The, the actual question I want to bring up to you, because I know you're another Ridley Scott film that you're a huge fan of is, is Gladiator. Yeah. I, I, was, I was checking this on the side. So the, the character played by Russell Crowe in the movie isn't real. Like that Roman emperor did not exist. Yeah. However, your emperors and shit of the time did exist. Right. And the way Commodus moves is not, I think, historically accurate. I haven't yeah. checked it, but I'm guessing do they move like that in real life? Right. Mm -hmm. It's very much purely for the drama of the moment. So when you look at a film like that, are you confused when you're watching it? Are you or, or is it again, are we going back to like the the eraser of them all, which is if it's good, like I don't give a shit. Yeah. Like you you do whatever you want to do yeah. if it's good. That's funny. Like yeah. wh where do you where do you fall with that? So okay. For me personally, when I watch a movie, 
I'm taking everything I see on screen as a piece of art. Like I'm, I'm genuinely right. personally speaking, I don't care if it's accurate or not because after the movie, that's when I want to go look up and go, Oh, how much of that was real? We talked about this right. a few times, right? Like yeah. literally the second I left Oppenheimer and Oppenheimer itself, like a biopic like that. Yes. It, it's biopics also like, because they're so specifically about a person, the expectation is even to, higher yeah. about like the mm-hmm, accuracy. Mm-hmm. But even then, and even to a film of this scale that I know with the scale it has probably feels a lot of pressure to be accurate to the guy as well. I still came out of that theater going, I'm going to look this dude up to see, you know, like was his relationship with that girl really like that pivotal in his life? Was he actually at some point a communist? Like what? Like all the stuff that I'm seeing, is it real? Like, is it real or was it just for the film? Everybody should be doing that due diligence, right? But we can't expect everyone to do that due diligence at the same time so that's where i say the distinction needs to be you cannot be doing damaging uh like representation of the history it needs to be like it, it, it's fine if it's like fictionalized for drama for dramatic reasons or whatever but it can't be like oppenheimer can't be the one dropping the bomb himself right like in this film like it's just it, it, it's it, like that would be a complete like it's it's weird because with art and all this stuff like there's not going to be a hard line of when you've crossed right. that line it's going right. to be very subjective and that's where i go my proxy for getting that objectivity is saying okay how do i classify this film first and then i can do my research afterwards we talked about this with killers of the flower moon right or even may december right, right? i watched may december completely as a fictional movie really surprised afterwards in the opposite direction to realize whoa a lot of that was real in fact this was about people this movie wasn't this movie wasn't called that lady's name that actress lady's name i forgot her name already it was called may december and it really was a- around like certain other elements of of the story so it didn't feel like a biopic about this person and therefore it didn't feel like like i i, I thought it was 100 percent fiction and so when i found out it was real that's the complete opposite reaction to had i maybe watched um you know, Lincoln, for example, and got really a bad right. case of that. Or like, uh, w- what's that movie with, um, like The Imitation Game, right? Like it turns out right. a, a big crux of that film is the, the um, I'm forgetting the the character's name, um, which I shouldn't because it's like a historical person, but his, I don't know if you've seen it, Admir. Turing. Alan yeah, Turing. Alan Turing. Yes, name? yes. His yeah. boss in the film is literally doing everything um, in his power to stop this machine from being built, the original computer, right? In mm-hmm. real life, his boss was like his biggest advocate. Okay, so that is like that. Like you've created strife out of nothing in this person's life, and it, that movie I feel on the fence about because it's not. It, it does feel a lot more fictional than a biopic. It's not the Turing film. It's like the imitation. It's just about like the the coding aspect of it, which is fine. It feels like a subplot enough that I'm not too mad. But it, that's where you go. Okay, is this gonna be different on a person to person basis? And is it going to like really influence your view of how the Turing machine got originally created if you if you thought this guy went through so much adversity that he was fighting people internally? Now you think people in the uh, British government um, were like were completely against the creation of the, like these computers, right. et cetera. So it, it, these things like whether we acknowledge it or not or even notice it or not subconsciously affect our view of history regardless yeah. of whether they're billed as fictional or non-fictional so that's where i go okay as a director as a creator of this film as a writer your job is not to be held to the same standards as a documentary or as a dictionary for example but your job is to not be damaging to history knowing the impact your film is going to have so and again how you define damaging super subjective but we're in a subjective art form here and i go okay well at the end of the day it really comes down to if we can't solve for any of this is it good or is it bad that's all, that's it <laughs> but i i i'm like for me weirdly enough the answer is sort of what you mentioned which is you as the viewer i think it's your responsibility to understand you're looking at art i don't for yeah. example look at a painting of the french revolution for example whatever the 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 famous one is with the with the lady and the and the mm-hmm. rifle and all that I don't look at that and go, that happened. (laughs) You know, that exactly happened. And that's (laughs) what I'm looking at. You know what I mean? This painter sat right there. (laughs) 
while this was right. happening and made it. Because the goal of that yeah. painting, for example, is not to necessarily be fiction, but it's like to uh, sort of, you know, transmit a an emotion of the time or, or mm-hmm. capture something, uh, you know, ethereal almost in art that you wouldn't be able to read in a textbook. But Admir, I ask you, okay, what is what is Go that ahead. painting meant to evoke, for example? It's meant well for me. It's meant to evoke like freedom, fighting for revolution, mm-hmm. fighting against these things that you know oppression, stuff like that. And then, what if I told you, for example, what really happened? And I, I don't know anything, right? But I'm just yes, saying. Yes. What if yes, what really happened yes. was that women were constantly being beat down and fighting for no fighting for no no like I'm saying like for example fighting for uh, personal yeah. rights and freedom. They they were not fighting for women's rights or freedom. It was only for men. Right. Would that yes. now change your perspective of that painting? I think it would it would make me feel shitty for that not embodying the truth. Yeah. It would make me feel shitty, but I wouldn't be like I like it less. You know right. what I mean? Right. But you would but you wouldn't have even thought to question that specific aspect because the theme to you is freedom. And that's where I go like Right. You can question th- did this revolution happen or not? But then a film mm-hmm. can do really twisting things where small things that you wouldn't question are the things that sure. are falsified and so but those things might be important to you in the long run because you go i don't know coming out of a movie what to question and what to not so now yes. to, to actually find out how accurate it is i need to go detail by detail cross-referencing everything that happened in the movie right. to know if it was real or not but, but yeah i mean but again like i i wouldn't necessarily do that i i think yeah. i wouldn't do like i left oppenheimer not with the 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 I didn't leave it with like, I know who J. Robert Oppenheimer was. Right. Like, I, I didn't feel like I knew the guy. What I what I left from that movie was, whether real or not, right? And yeah. this is maybe because of age or, or just because we watch movies in and out and we have the podcast and all this shit. But I left that film going, my takeaway is this dude is in like a rock in a hard place yeah. and he it, it's very finely poised within history because of the consequences of his decision right mm-hmm. so the consequences of his decision are real for example so like i for for to to go to your definition of like bad to history it's true that he helped create it for example right? mm-hmm. you don't want to mess with that point right yeah so i take that and obviously i assume that's true because it fits into the theme of, of sort of what's going on here. I, I mm-hmm. feel like the elements that have to be true have to fit with the larger theme kind of as opposed mm-hmm. to the minutia of the details of it all. Like Agreed. if if the theme, if the story cheats the theme in a historical fiction, I would feel some type of way. Agreed. So Agreed. Like, the, the, yeah. like if I was Christian and I watched The Da Vinci Code, I would 100% feel some type of way. First of all, that movie isn't that great. Let's also put it out there. I didn't watch the movie. I only read the book. We're, yeah. we're putting it up. But like, it's not it's not, it's not, not the best. And I, I go back to Kingdom of Heaven because this is where mm-hmm. we started from. The takeaway from that film thematically, I think is very, uh, very clear. It's very clear. And yes, it's driven by fictionalized events by real characters. But for me, that... I don't see that as damaging history because I think the theme is accurate to history. The takeaway yeah. is accurate to history. So if Oppenheimer, for example, didn't have a relationship with, uh, which he did with, mm-hmm. with uh, I forget her character's name, uh, Florence Pugh's character. Mm-hmm. Like if that's not true, I'm okay with that because the theme is still there. Like we haven't, now, the movie isn't now dead yeah. in the yeah. water because of this element of the story. So I don't know, maybe that for me is my my threshold. What if like, Oppenheimer- Do I still, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, what if Oppenheimer, what if he was never troubled by his motivations? Like, does that change the theme for you? Yes, yeah. yes it does. Because I, I think so much of, so much of like that, that story for me is, there was no right decision. Right. And then it became about his subjective a reading of a situation mm-hmm. and to some degree his lack of owning his decisions that yeah. led to the consequences that we have today so like that has to remain intact how you get there mm-hmm. right is sort of up to the director and how much he wants to be true to yeah. the actual events that unfolded and weirdly enough that was one of my sort of you know, soft, you know, reasons for not loving Killers of the Flower Moon. It felt so much like, 
we are sticking to the story almost beat for beat here mm. that we get to the end of it and it almost loses that element which you said of like being enter- entertaining necessarily or compelling yeah and it, it more so felt like a straightforward retelling of of happenings mm-hmm. right so like balancing that and again i don't i don't which is also Scorsese, valid like to your point yes like, it's, it's not maybe yeah. not what we were looking for but that's also an opportunity for filmmaking too yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's just, and, and some people loved it for that reason, mm-hmm. right? Because of the subject matter, because of the characters and such, right? You, you want to tell maybe that story in that way, mm-hmm. as opposed to doing it more, you know, where, where things are fictionalized. And and that's probably the other element of it, which is how far back does the story go and how much does it affect us today? And how often I think that's a it, huge part of it. And how often has the story been told? Then there's like yes. a, a different expectation. Yes. Like, that's yeah. where we, we had that conversation with Killers of the Flower Moon of like, this story yeah. hasn't properly been told. There's a lot of onus yeah. on this. I was talking the other day with Keanu about I haven't seen When They See Us, right? The the Netflix doc on the Central Park Five, right? That's a really yep. Um, yep. sentimental topic, a really like powerful topic, one that you probably don't want to take too much leeway with, right? But why? Right. It's because it's not it's, it hasn't been memorialized to the point where it's been done 20 times and then you can make some, yeah. take some leeway with I it. I agree. Something like Jesus unfortunately whether people like it or not um can be dramatized a little bit because there's so much material on what really happened yeah that you can right. go okay like this if i even just did one google search i would know this actually right. is not what is in the books right or even you know even talking about a, a what some people might deem as a fictional book like any religious book for example is still source mm-hmm. material that we're talking about and so I think this is honestly a really interesting topic in general because I, I struggle to find that line too. And yeah, there are so many qualifiers, like we said, whether, whether the movie is good or not, whether the story's been told before or not, how sensitive is this topic? Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. How integral to the to the overall plot is the is the fictional, non-fictional element? I think where we're getting to is to answer the question of how important it is for the story to be to be accurate is I think if the summary of the film is historically accurate then i think we're good if the so. and i mean like the really short synopsis because if, yeah. if you mess yeah. that up then the, the whole premise of the film is built on falsities and even though that's technically allowed because it's a fictional film it's a bit damaging to history right like i don't i don't know what the synopsis for oppenheimer is but i imagine none of the stuff about his girlfriend or any of that people are going to be in that synopsis for the film and right, so right. Those details, take whatever leeway you want with it as long as they're not extremely damaging. If there was never a trial, pretty damaging to to that film, right? Like the whole point right. is this guy is like facing this consequence both emotionally, personally, and literally in court. And so like if those things were gone, I agree with you. Like, And, it, and, and then any critic will then say, okay, well, where is the, the exact line between major plot point yeah. and um, subplot points that are unnecessary? And that's where you have start to you can layer in those other questions of like there's leeway afforded if the movie is good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I wouldn't I wouldn't want to police it. This is the other thing. Like I don't think we're asking the question to yeah. like police it. Like I mentioned, I didn't watch Napoleon because of that. But I wouldn't be like, how dare they do this to Napoleon, right? I would, however, feel some type of way if they did that about like an you know, Albanian cultural figure where like right. we don't have those representations in film. So the first one can't be vibes you know what i mean like you kind of got to set some benchmark of like some truth to this and then once i think that solidified someone in in the social space maybe you go from there yeah it is a very interesting thing and again i I, the examples of uh, movies that fall in the middle are super interesting so fictional character with a real person is great i love those uh the the film from a, a couple years ago um God, what was it? We, I really liked it. It was about uh, uh, a very young Muhammad Ali meeting. It mm. was a couple other figures from like the uh, oh, the, oh, the oh. 60s and um, such. Regina King directed it. Uh, I know the movie you're talking about. It is... <laughs> Drum roll. <laughs> uh, night in... Uh, is it Night in Miami? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Night in Miami? Is it? Night in Soho? Uh, yeah, night in Soho? Night... No, 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 no. One night in... Yeah, it's One Night in Miami. Miami. Yes. Miami. It's it's a fictional meeting of Jim Brown, Cassius Clay, yeah. Sam Cooke, and Malcolm X following, I think, one of Muhammad Ali's fights, which was a film I loved and I adored. And it's you go into it knowing it's fictional. These characters did not meet. But you 
the 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 pure you know fantasy of what if yeah played out so well and it was one of my favorite movies of the year so i would hate to to sit here and be like no you know this is the line you can't right. and of course in that film i don't think from what i recall things are damaged or or like uh histories are damaged but um but even then it's, that was it's such squarely, a riveting movie it's squarely in that historical fiction camp so i i actually don't care what happens with it mm-hmm. i think everything i was mentioning for example is squarely within the the historical camp of like if you're making a film that's not billed as like completely fake th- like this film is because it's just not possible right but if you're building something that that is possible but you're now right. like bending the truth that's different it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I think epics, especially like historical epics, are you got to be wary of that. Um, but I, ultimately, I do think mm-hmm. it is down to us to do that. Like, I don't want to make a director's job to like teach me history, kind of thing. Um, all, all this convinced me was that we need to we need to drop a video essay on this topic. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> there you are uh academy awards real quick i'm gonna run down some of the surprises you pick out the one that's the most glaring and uh you tell me what you think about it uh no margot robbie for best actress for barbie uh no greta lee uh for best actress in uh past lives in, was it past lives no leo dicaprio uh best actor in killers of the flower moon no adapted screenplay for killers of the flower moon no Willem Dafoe supporting in Poor Things. No Greta Gerwig in director uh, for Barbie. And then the one, I guess, positive one that kind of surprised us was America Ferrara for uh, her role in Barbie. She had a nomination for Best Supporting Actress. There was also nominations for, I think, uh, for Jodie Foster in Nyad. And let me see. Uh, the main actress from that film was... Where are we here? Uh, Annette Benning. She also got a uh, best actor or best actress uh, nomination. We haven't seen that movie, so I really yeah. can't talk about it. But the other ones we have seen, which one is the most glaring, Osama? Honestly, I feel like none of them are ridiculously glaring based on the results of uh, the Golden Globes, for example. But I think Barbie, like. Well, Barbie has three of those, actually, right? It's the positive one is America for our, I think. Right. That to me is the biggest surprise. But the biggest glaring issue for me is um, Margot Robbie not getting uh, like the best actor nom. Like this is how many times has it happened where a top two film of the year grossing doesn't right. have the the main protagonist in uh, um, lead actress. So I, I think... That one is is kind of is kind of wild, and I think that movie we talked about it last episode. But that movie, I think a lot of people are souring on it over time, and I think that's unjustified, just because it was like it had this like crazy. I think of it as like an aspartame spike. Like you have this like crazy right, right. short like. All right, you could have just said moment. sugar. You didn't need sugar to do that. spike. You didn't need to do all that aspartame <laughs> propaganda because, against it. You know, real sugar spikes gradually. Oh. Aspartame sh- spikes in one massive insulin spike. So, but I think the cultural moment for Barbie was just so like short lived that I think people go back and go, oh, slightly cringe. And then because of that, they go, oh, the, like the, 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 I feel now like, uh, I feel like worse about the film than I did at the time. And I just think that's unfair. So, and, and I think it's more unfair to have, uh, yeah. Margot Robbie not nominated. At least, I don't think she would win it either way. But I don't think she doesn't right. deserve a nomination. Uh, just to give you a heads up, so the movie was nominated for six Academy Awards: uh, Best Costume, Best Production, Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Supporting Actress, Best Supporting Actor, and a Best Picture. The Best Adapted so Screenplay from- is just like that's the that's the one where I, I don't know, I don't know, like not including Killers of the Flower Moon and then including Barbie is crazy. Uh, yeah, I think I got that right, unless I was taking notes wrongly, because now I'm questioning myself. But let because me check again. Because it was again. based on a book, wasn't it? Wasn't it based on the book of like... It was, um, uh, but I just want to see. I want to make sure I have the right... Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Best Adapted Screenplay was American Fiction, Barbie, Oppenheimer, Poor Things, and The Zone of Interest. Which yeah, one of so these does not belong? Yeah, so for me, for me, for me, I think it's the director one, actually. 
Uh, I, I hear you on the Margot Robbie one, 100%. But the reason I'm coming at it from that one is because they nominated literally everything else around the movie <laughs> that the director would have like a huge say in. Yeah. Mind you, also, she helped write it. You know, she was one of two people who wrote it along with Noah Baumbach. So I'm struggling to see, and I've always been weird on this. You cannot give a best picture nominee and not do not the director. director yeah. Now, yeah. So it's, it's, I understand that the best director category is far smaller. You only get five in there, but the five, like I, I, you know, I guess all the five also had their movies nominated. So they, there goes my shit falls <laughs> on <inside. laughs> But I still find it odd they do this. Yeah. I find it so odd that you give a film this many key sort of Phil, nominations. Zone of interest just the director jumped in and became like like just crashed this whole party for a lot of different categories. We haven't I think seen for it. For me, obviously. yes, I haven't seen it. But my my hate movie is Maestro, and if if you <laughs> deal with that one, you can put uh, Margot Robbie back. So sorry, uh, Carrie Mulligan. I haven't seen the movie. I don't know what your performance is, yeah. but I, I don't care. Um, <laughs> but at least Maestro didn't get no nomination for best director. Um, yeah. So I, I I don't. If anyone is listening or watching it. and is like, what? where did this just come from? <laughs> We've developed a strong disdain oh. for that film for absolutely no reason, mind you. Like we haven't seen Maestro, we don't know anything about it. But this this strong, smelly campaign from Bradley Cooper to get this film awarded in multiple areas is just it 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 it's it, it it's borderline distasteful, you know. And it's not uh, it, man. Yeah, it's 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 not it. Enjoyable. Like watch. I'm looking, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the movies uh, the, in the best picture. So like American Fiction nominated, but no director. Barbie, no director. Holdovers, no director. Uh, uh, Maestro, no director. And then Past, Past Lives, lives yep. no director. Those are the five movies that got a best picture nomination, but not a best director. Um, I, I, I don't know how I feel about them doing this ten best pictures, but no like equivalently large ass pool of directors man so why are we doing 10 best picture then i don't understand cut it down to seven or eight or something yeah because it's a little bit outrageous especially to get a, a the adapted one i don't know that one confused me and it's greta gerwig dude like i feel like that was a lock that director one i felt like was a mm -hmm. lock that yeah. one that one it's I surprising i have to watch it back and and like yeah there, there was just a lot that was great about the film right and directing is more than just what you see frame by frame too. So I see your point, man. Like I feel like Who best director, honestly, best directing should just be the same size as uh, best picture in terms of number of nominations. I don't see why it should be s shorter. It's so tough. Who are you kicking out? If you're doing five here, I mean, are you, put, are you kicking out? I'm kicking out zone of interest. Cause I haven't seen anything from that film. And, but the thing is the crazy parts, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dropping in, Greta Gerwig still, so that kind of goes against this whole entire argument. <laughs> I'm you definitely still, putting you feel like those, yeah, uh, not the holdovers. I don't think I'm definitely putting uh, either American Fiction or Past Lives, just because of how unique the film was. Right. But yeah, like I don't know, but that, that's why I felt slightly different about the Gerwig one than you did. I still think. I think at the end of the day, it should just be the same size list. 10 and 10. Sorry, you got eight nominations. Did I read something off? Barbie got eight nominations. Oppenheimer mm. got 13. Poor Things got 11. Killers of the Flower Moon got 10. Barbie got eight. Maestro got seven. And then American Fiction, Anatomy of Fall, Holdover, Zone of Interest got five. Damn. I just, that's a lot of nominations to not get a director, man. Eight. Eight. Same a lot, size. I think. Same size. Make best directing. Like, what is the purpose? Why would best directing be the same size as all these other categories? Why should best directing have the same size as best, um, you know, best sound, for example? Like, I feel like it should be the other way around. I feel like best picture should be the one that's more narrow and all the other categories should too. be a little bit that wider. Too. That would make more sense. But I guess it's like... Yeah, yeah. It's literally the one with the least a uh, total, <laughs> like total sample size. Like, there's definitely fewer movies than people that worked on the movies, guys. 
<laughs> like I don't I don't know. I feel like it should be like that. I feel like you should you should celebrate more. I guess they yeah. want to do the thing where they celebrate the whole movie. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to trying to celebrate individuals, but that's that's tough for me. That's tough for me. I'm going to end it real quick with just a little bit of a, a a teeny annoyance with what happened at the Emmys. First of all, I don't give a shit about the Emmys. They gave uh, Game of Thrones season garbage a couple of Emmys a few years ago. <laughs> season and garbage. Is that the official name? <laughs> I think so. That's the extended cut call uh, <laughs> name. Anyway, so I've completely tuned out of the Emmys. What I did notice, though, is that they do this thing now, and I don't know if this has been consistent throughout the Emmys history because I haven't watched enough to say, but this year it was literally three tv shows that mattered apparently in a whole in a, an entire year of tv if you weren't succession the bear or beef <laughs> you didn't matter yeah. right i don't know if this is an issue with the way we look at academy or just award shows i don't know if it's the way the awards are divvied up i just don't know it it feels odd to have so many awards concentrated in so few shows and I don't know if that's because of the quality or or just because of these no, shows are so much shows. better. Yeah. I don't know. For me, the thing that, that inspired this whole thing is, look, I've watched Better Call Saul uh, for the last you know six, seven years, however long it's been on TV. Um, that show hit the record this year, 53 nominations without winning one. And that included acting and cinematography and all that good stuff. So a lot of technical awards as well. And just to add some context to that, this is one of the greatest reviewed TV shows in recent history to the point where everybody that I know that watches this show is like, this is a top 10 show of all time, or at least top three show currently yeah. on, on TV. So I, I, I don't know if it's worse than not being nominated and not winning. But being nominated that many times to not win, I think, is a joke. The bigger joke, though, <laughs> the bigger lay joke it on me. Yeah, what's the bigger joke? Is, I hope is, it's funny. is when you is when you well, there you go. I've now lost my. Hold on, I got to pull out my Wikipedia app of my phone because I had it. Um, this guy has a Wikipedia app. I do have nah. a Wikipedia app. It's really useful, ladies and gentlemen. I didn't even know that existed. The more I think about it, it's just even crazier that. This few shows got celebrated um, at the Emmys because not only are there more shows, presumably, than movies coming out throughout, uh, maybe not, maybe not more shows, but there's more yeah. seasons of shows and there's more right. episodes of shows coming out. So for those three to have the biggest splash at the Emmys is kind of crazy knowing the longevity that Better Call Saul. I mean, and I say this with having not seen a single episode of Better Call Saul, by the way. So, uh, my my whole beef here mostly, and it's uh, my beef with, with, with uh, it's with a lot, but it's with Bob Odenkirk especially. So his first time he gets nominated, he loses to John Hamm in Mad Men, which this I think is acceptable. One? This is season one of Better Call Saul, mm -hmm. losing to I think the last season of Mad Men, which I think is acceptable. Fine. Season two of Better Call Saul, he loses to Rami Malek and Mr. Robot. That's a show <laughs> I feel some type of way about. Oh, I Some feel a very hard about. way about. I've been, I literally remember back in the day being so down on this show in even early in the first few episodes, mind you, this is a show everybody loved. This is another, a fellow Egyptian here that I, I definitely celebrate personally. He's a great actor, was an Oppenheimer. Yeah. Great job. But that show was so corny to me from like first episode. So to see that is also kind of crazy. He wins there. The season, and I agree with you. I, I I've never seen a more uh, uh, condescending show <laughs> in my life. In my life. Anyway, moving on. The year after, he loses to Sterling K. Brown in This Is Us, which I haven't seen, mm -hmm. but I always heard great things about. And I know the guy yeah. is a great actor, so I can see that. The season after. He's not nominated, and the award goes to Matt Reese in The Americans, who had been also nominated every year up until that point. Mm. Uh, then he loses to Billy Porter in Pose, and I don't know what that show is. Mm. Um, the year after that's that, season five. He, now we're in season six, right? I think that's season five. Mm -hmm. Five, I think, still, still mm -hmm. five, maybe um, or four. Because then in 2020, he's not nominated. Jeremy Strong wins for Succession. In 2021, uh, he's not nominated, I think, here again, if I have this right. 
uh, yes, and, and uh, Josh O'Connor wins in the crown. And then in 2022, he is nominated and he loses to Lee Jung Jae from Squid Game. Hmm. And then this year, he loses to Kieran Culkin in succession. So again, he loses to a succession, a Squid Games. Squid Game guy got pose. best actor? Yeah. Look at that. Well, that's Please. what a celebration for our Squid Game guy. Uh, this is us and Mr. Robot and Mad Men. I has a joke. Yeah. It's such a joke, bro. Also, I think it's such a joke. what were the, do you have on hand the uh, reviews for each seat? Like, did it, did this, I'm trying to wonder, did the show pick up at a certain point? Was, did it Call start Saul? great? Yeah. Better Call Saul's first season, I think, is at a 70 something. On Metacritic, and I'll, I'll go to Metacritic here because they tend to be the harsher, they give you the harsher metric. Uh, uh, the So season, hold on, let me see if you'll say. Season one starts at a 78, mm-hmm. and then it goes 85, 87, 87, 92, 94. <laughs> so like consistently elite since season two. And they win nothing. I, the Bob mad. Odenkirk one is, is my hill to die on, but they win nothing else. And why is like why was he deserving of it? Is it a show that like again oh. I haven't seen it? Is it a show that was carried by the ensemble? Like was this a show that was like just really well directed, well written, etc.? Or is he like the main reason? No, I, I think every element of that show is spectacular. I think there's an argument to be made that his co-star uh, Rhea Seahorn is the better actor by the end of the show, like mm. has the better performance, who, by the way, also lost in this last Emmys <laughs> to Jennifer Coolidge for Best Actress. For White Lotus? She won for the same character wait, because wait, we're wait. going back. Yeah, yeah, she I went back s- to back years. Why is she? I saw season one, all right? It wasn't like yeah. that great of a performance. I haven't seen season two of The White Lotus but I don't see like the scope where her character should be winning best actress. That's crazy. That's actually mind blowing to me. But again, I'm, I'm super down on that show it. compared to a lot of people. So. No, no, no. And I'm up yeah. on that show. I've been the one who's yeah. been pushing it in the group chats and to you and all this shit. And I sat there and I went, there's no way. Cause see the last season of better call Saul is outstanding. It's an yeah. outstanding season and a great way to bring things to a close. And, uh, Ray Seahorn especially is, Fantastic, because she's got to match what he's doing. Mm-hmm. When you watch Better uh, Breaking Bad, you're not really asking for somebody to pull up and match uh, Brian Cranston for right, the most right. part, right? You're not really doing that. Mm-hmm. Better Call Saul, you are, and it's very much consistent for the entire show, and it works really well because she she's right up there with him, with um, Bob Odenkirk. So for me, just to like put a, put a cap on it, it just. I don't think it matters at the end of the day. I think shows like The Wire, who only won two Emmys in their whole run, more jokes, uh, <laughs> still go on to be beloved, right? And if you do win it, like a Rami Malik, ain't nobody talking about that show, Brev. <laughs> I, that no I, one's talking I forgot about, about the Mr. existence Robot. of Mr. Robot until <laughs> we just talked about it, man. Nobody, nobody. It, it is, I've it's only come up once or twice since that show ended. And yeah. I know so many people that fell off from that final season because of how just whatever it was. So I don't know what the Emmys are doing. I don't know if we're in a place with, with award shows where it feels like we got to stay hip and fresh and all this shit. And it's not to discount the winners of some of these awards. Cause I'm sure yeah. succession was amazing. And I'm sure Sterling K Brown and this is us is, is fantastic, but you sit there and you go, there's no wait, Sorry. One- who, who won a uh, lead actor for a show this year? This year was yeah. uh, Kieran Culkin for Succession. Yeah, that one I actually had issue with, like originally. And I remember talking and to Chris about this. you had issues with it. And yeah. I loved Succession. And I love Kieran right. Culkin in Succession. But to me, he wasn't like not over people that carry the show. And I had issue with it compared to like Pedro Pascal, right. for example. Let alone Bob Odenkirk, who's been doing right. this for what, like six, seven years, like you said. So yeah. that's just crazy. Yeah. And, and then seeing the clip go around of him. Like seeing, yeah. like uh, seeing himself not win again, and then have to talk about it in these interviews was was pretty sad, man. That's I haven't what did even it seen for me, that, yeah. bro. That's what did it for me, man. Because you, ha- I, I also see this as like, first of all, what that show is able to do but to have like an all time show, and then to be like, we're gonna spin it off, <laughs> and it's gonna be six seasons long, and it's gonna be a prequel, and it's also gonna bang. <laughs> what? 
There's 13 years of this world that has been great to fantastic. Yeah. Right? That was created by Vince Gilligan and the characters in there. And I know Breaking Bad got its love, but it feels so weird that this show didn't, especially considering it didn't come up like against a juggernaut. You know, it wasn't like up against the best of Game of Thrones or Mad Men or like peak, peak TV. Yeah. The last six, seven years has been like one season of a show has been great. Then another season of a show has been great. And then, you know, Succession came out pretty late, I think in 2017, 2018. So it's not like the last 10 years have been dominated by one or two shows. Mm -hmm. And yet here we are. So I don't know if we need like a different way of, you know, giving the awards or to just not give a shit about them whatsoever and just carry on with recommendations from your boys or whatnot. (laughs) But. It just, it just feel. I, I felt so bad. I genuinely, rarely feel bad, and I felt bad about this one. And it's actually changed my mind about going into the Oscars, and not changed my mind, but it's, it's strengthened my position of like, I don't care who wins. Yeah, I literally don't care. Like, I love the performances. They're not going to change because they got the award or not. That it's not going to confirm my sad, feelings like, about a performance. When you retire and look back at it, you want to see, like, as a guy like him, you want to see those accolades to represent the good work that you did on this show. That's true. Otherwise, it's hard to represent that good work again other than saying go watch a seven season show or however long it is so that is like it's just tough to see it's annoying to see and there should be more award shows for tv i guess that can represent stuff like that i don't know i'm sure there are but this was like this is the pinnacle you know i'm sure this is what dudes are 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 fighting for you just get so many for film win that you would think like some of them are going to branch out to tv you would hope I know they do. I know they have them. It's just the Emmys are the one that sticks to mind. Um, yeah. I don't know if there's like a Golden Globes equivalent. I'm sure there is, but it just doesn't feel like they have. They're the hundred percent. It's like always Emmys like uh, yeah. some t- like equivalent of like Critics Guild. Choice or TV Guild. Yeah, yeah Screen Guilds. Actors Guild. Yeah, like <laughs> million awards. But we got to start the Our Two Cents uh, awards again. Yo, by the way, Golden Globes also does have TV like awards as well. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think I actually haven't checked that one, but they also have TV shows. But those are also shambolic because I'm pretty <laughs> sure they did the Game of Thrones thing as well or but, something. But they're I everything is them shambolic. The so it's it's on. That's brand. true. It's a vibe award show. We're gonna cut it here, man. This went on dumb long as usual, uh, but so good, so good. <laughs> so good. I, I, um, I feel like a lot of these need warrant further discussion, but that's why we have a podcast and we get to <laughs> the platform to continue to to chat shit every week. Only after an hour forty seven do you feel like oh, I didn't feel like we ended that with, <laughs> with everything I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> yo, late Outrageous, at night, late man. at night in the shower. Oh, yo, I can't believe <laughs> that point that I wrote down. I didn't even mention it <laughs> in the napkin in the corner of like the, the table that we're at right now. <laughs> We'll be back next week with episode three of Night Country, along with uh, whatever else rocks the boat in in the space of Hollywood. Sama, appreciate your presence as always, brother. Thanks for a uh, great conversation. Pleasure as always. Your your week there. To everyone who listened, and of course, if you watch, subscribe. Let us know below what you we thought about Night Country and uh, any anything else we mentioned really in the conversation. We appreciate all the all the interactions. Help the channel uh, get friendlier with the algo, which Mm. is really the goal. Yes. It's really the goal. Allow it to hug and kiss the algo, and we can come hug and kiss you, please, on our journey. If Remember, we said a thousand subs by June. Yeah, please. If we don't yeah. get it by June, I have a gun to Admir's forehead at the moment, Therefore, and okay. I will, uh, well, no, quite literally, and I will have to, mm-hmm. unfortunately, end this man with our podcast if you guys don't get us to a thousand subs by June. Please help. I'm blinking twice. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace.